repeat once more the last paragraph of the last section. But the body of Christ, the laity, and the religious orders are more and more less inclined to accept that Rome should have such authority. This should not be a wonder, because Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Church has never had anything to fear from the truth. Never. Although every act of repression and control was a demonstration of this fear. The reality is that strangulation of ideas is evidence of the absence of real faith. True faith, which is essentially trust, has nothing to fear from science, for example, and never has had to fear knowledge or other ways, including the ancient ways and traditions of the wisdom of the kings. Yet, in its efforts to dominate ideas, to compel what is allowed to be thought by its members, whether in terms of moral teachings or doctrines, the Church itself has become the opponent of Christ. To oppose the truth is to oppose Christ. We describe as totalitarian a political state which wants to control thoughts and ideas. How then we should we describe the institutional Roman Church? One way to understand this fall from grace into corruption and totalitarian thought control is to appreciate that social forms, such as an institutional religion, can begin in a state of aliveness and then over time become sclerotic or hardened, the same way the human body becomes hardened over time. This can also happen to religious orders within the Church after their founders have crossed over for example, the at one time independence of the Jesuits has become lost, and they became essentially an intellectual warlike arm of the Pope. Results were more important than means, and the true significance of the practice of the Ignatius meditations, or essence of the rule of the order, became confused. The history of the Roman Church is littered with such ruins. Fortunately, some will keep the practices of the various religious orders alive, for so there are always pockets where hardening and dogmatic fundamentalism is kept out. Now with this background, we can begin to consider the even greater, though yet mostly unknown, spiritual crime that the Church recently committed in the 20th century. Let me first put this forward as a sequence of hypotheses, as several suppose that's. Suppose that as natural science began to dominate the thinking of the world, in its conclusions that all was matter and that there was no spirit, natural science became what in John 1, the letter John 1, would have been called an aspect of the spirit of the Antichrist. In that long ago language we can still today find the right modern idea if we not, do not make too exaggerated our approach. What does the language in John 1 say? but that the Antichrist spirit will deny the existence of the Son and of the Father. This is what natural science does today, in that it teaches that there is only matter and never spirit. Do not be confused by those zealots who think the Antichrist is a person who will bring destruction and end times. This is not so. The Antichrist spirit simply penetrates human consciousness in the absence of Christian practices and then denies the Son and the Father as the writer of John 1 understood through the examples he saw in his time. It, this Antichrist spirit, expresses itself as an idea contrary to the truth. But Christ is the truth, as our faith would tell us. If then science denies the Father and the Son, then somehow it has failed to find the truth. It may know a great deal, but something must be missing. Let me repeat this in another way. Christ is truth. Science denying spirit and saying all is only matter denies the Father and the Son. Our faith, our trust, then tells us this kind of science must be flawed. But where do we find a science that knows the spirit? He promised to be with us to the ends of time. Is he with us in this dilemma now? Most religious institutions believe the situation is one of debate, say between a scientific thinker such as Sam Harris and between someone of a more religious persuasion. 
It is argued by some religious that religion has as its proper territory the question of morals, and they are willing to leave to science the question of facts. But Mr. Harris is relentless and now asserts that this flawed science not only should dominate the question of facts, but give us morals as well. If we look to the leaders of the institutional church, we don't get much of a moral example. So what can be done? Well, faith would suggest that Christ would act and not leave us alone in this failed situation, would not leave us bound to the materialism, all is matter and there is no spirit, of present-day science. Suppose he did. Suppose during the early parts of the 20th century he found a voice for new revelation. That not only did Christ find such a voice crying in the wilderness of scientific materialism, all matter, no spirit, suppose the exercise of that voice predicted Christ's true spiritual second coming, just as the first John the Baptist predicted Christ's physical incarnation. Further suppose that all this happened in a way in which the problems that might face such acts of Christ could be met with the standards of inquiry common today to natural science. Suppose that in, the sec in this second voice, crying in the wilderness, there existed the capacity to unite science and religion without damage to the true nature of either way of being in the world. In addition, suppose that the true second coming began its principal effects upon the world during the darkest horrors of the twelve years of World War II, from the burning of the Reichstag in 1933 to the exploding of the atomic bomb in 1945, a time when millions of Jews and Russians and Germans and hundreds of thousands of others were murdered in war. And suppose that true to what Christ had predicted, that he said he would come in a certain form of way, this he actually did. Here is Matthew 26, 64. Jesus replied, You have said it. In the future you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Suppose that the stream of ancient wisdom, the kings of the gospel stories, are at work again today. Given the opportunity to give birth into life a new revelation, new spiritual truth belonging to the age of science, something happens in the world right in front of the male-dominating hierarchies of the fallen Roman Church, and they ignore it, just as they ignored the priests who steal innocence, and just as they ignored the Holocaust, and just as they ignored the countless other crimes within the Roman Church in order to preserve the institutional church at the expense of the practice of the religion. That's Boz.